Hey everyone, peace, my Kamnacha. I was planning out a new series here on the channel around taking a first look at new and interesting projects and SDKs that are out there. I'll explain a little bit more about that in the future videos, but just know that the first thing that I was planning to take a look at was how you could use Ethereum within Unity. And while I was recording that, I realized there's a lot of miscellaneous knowledge that I'm kind of using as the framework for building out that video that unless it gets consolidated into some form of an explanation video, it's not gonna make a ton of sense. So that's exactly what this video is. And this is not gonna be the type of video where we go over what is a blockchain, what are proof of stake versus proof of work and the various different algorithms that use to, to make the blockchain work. There are plenty of videos that already exist for that. What this video is is specifically how does Ethereum smart contracts works? How can I practically go about using Ethereum to start putting together a technical project and eventually get to the point, which we'll cover in the next video, which is how you can leverage the blockchain within Unity. With that summary said, what I'd love to know down in the comments below, do you own any crypto? Do you own any Ethereum? Obviously owning Ethereum well, we'll actually go through in this video is not going to be a prerequisite, actually, but I would just be curious to know what the overlap is in terms of game developers and Unity developers and blockchain owners and blockchain enthusiasts. So definitely let me know down in the comments below. And if you do find this video helpful, make sure to leave a like on the video because it really does help out the channel a ton. To start with, you'll fundamentally first need some form of a wallet. Now, there are a bunch of Ethereum wallets out there. The one I personally use uh, just for simplicity's sake, and I think it works pretty natively with a lot of web apps that I use that are based on blockchain is MetaMask. But in general, what a wallet is, it is basically a public and private key. So if you're familiar at all with any cryptography, public private keys are pretty much what makes security work. It is you give a public key, which in, in the case of Ethereum is your address. That address is what you can use to make transactions on the blockchain. You'll have a private key that acts as your identity and you should never give that out to anybody. Anyone asking for your private key is definitely affiliated with a scam. So make sure you do not give your private key to anybody. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the specifics on like how you should store your private key. I personally use a hardware wallet, but again, I mean, that that's a completely separate topic. The important part here is everything is kind of addressed as a public and private key. Your private key is what you will use to do a cryptographic signature, which is what this Ethereum SDK will actually does uh, to validate any messages you want to have happen on the blockchain are coming from you and everyone else knows that they're specific to you. So that, that is basically what a wallet is and MetaMask will walk you through that process of setting up your own public private key pair. And then uh, you'll, you'll have those specific values that you can go ahead and plug in when we dive into say some of that, the SDK work as well. So something to keep in mind that that's something you'll definitely, if you've never used Ethereum before, you'll wanna go ahead and create. It's pretty easy to do. It comes with a web extension it's not showing up here because I'm using a private incognito browser, but you get the gist that that that's how that'll happen. Once you have a wallet and once you have your public private key pair, you'll then want to start taking a look at smart contracts. Now, smart contracts, it's, it's really kind of the key distinguishing feature for Ethereum versus say Bitcoin. And it's honestly why I'm more bullish on Ethereum and that ecosystem in general. But all a smart contract is, is a piece of code. Sometimes you, you'll, you'll hear the phrase bytecode re represented just because uh, that's how it'll ultimately end up getting stored on a blockchain. But it's a piece of code that has a bunch of functions that you can call. So a very common example is, is tokens that are used on Ethereum. And so you might have a function, actually I might have an example right here, I think on this page. Yeah, here we go. So this is an example uh, template. So you'll have a function that is specifically like balance of, 
you will go ahead and pass in whichever balance that you want to look at. So that's your input. And then the output will be a an int in this case, which is specifically the balance. So what you'll do once you have this wallet is you will you will craft up a message uh, that will contain the, the function that you want to call the input, which is whatever address owner, you will use your private key to validate that transaction. And then you can send it off into the blockchain. So that, that's just one example. Um, and this is more of a read only state. So as a result, you, you'll see here, it's marked with external view. So that actually means you don't really anyone can view it. Um, some, of, some of the more nuanced ones will be like this transfer from. So if you're actually making um, a modification to the blockchain, generally, if you want to write to the blockchain, you need, you need to have that private key to, to validate your message. So that's the nuts and bolts of really what makes a smart contract. This ends up getting compiled into what is known as a bytecode. And you can then go to any website, say like, for example, Etherscan, and then you can look up a specific contract. So for example, let's just pull up, if we want to take a look at the contract for say, basic attention token, just because I love this. And we want to go here to Etherscan. Um, let's see. Oh, I have to look at the contract. Here we go. So uh, if you go to the contract specifically, there's this contract section. This is the code that represents the, the specific uh, functions that were all part of this smart contract. And this is not human readable. Uh, but what is important about this is since this represents the smart contract, it also is a means for us to communicate with it. And so uh, when we take a look at the Unity SDK, this bytecode here will actually get ended up getting plugged into the SDK so that it can map functions onto the, the smart contract. So that's just something to note here in terms of what how things end up getting stored. The other thing in terms of cost, the way transactions work in general on Ethereum is that when you make a transaction, you pay a fee typically in Ethereum. There are some updates that are changing where you can pay it in some other different types of currencies, but in general, you pay it in Ethereum and that's what's known as your gas fee. When you call a smart contract, that gas fee is basically how much you're willing to pay on a individual function call level. So for example, if I want to do an addition on a smart contract, I'm going to be paying a fee. A multiplication might cost a separate fee. A square root, which is a little bit more complicated, might cost another fee. A table lookup is gonna cost another fee. Those costs can typically change depending on the updates, but they generally tend to be fairly stable and they're tied to the complexity of work associated with each function. So in general, if you're building a smart contract and you want to enable more users to actually use the smart contract, you're gonna to wanna to minimize the number of the, the amount of computation that your program has to do and optimize around some of these costs. Um, as an end user, you basically, when you submit a transaction, you're saying, here's the amount of Ethereum that I want to pay for a given function, as well as the max amount of Ethereum I want to pay for my total message to actually be validated by the blockchain. Once your transaction gets processed, starts to get processed by the blockchain, the whoever is processing will tally up the total amount of compute that gets run because of the input that you generated. And then based on that, they will end up taking the fee. So that's an important thing to, to keep in mind in terms of if you're building out smart contracts, you want to kind of minimize some of these costs a little bit more nuanced. And I wouldn't recommend that if you're especially starting out. But in general, I think that's important to keep in mind as you want to minimize the amount of costs that is generated by your end users ultimately. We briefly took a look here at the concepts of an ERC 721 token. The short of this is these are basically standards for how to write your own smart contracts. 
So ERC721 is the standard for a non-fungible token. Non-fungible token means that you've basically created a token and it will be not uh, translatable to any other token. So for example, I'm creating VRR and Tilt Brush. I want to have a token assigned to that. That's going to be non-fungible because the value of that token is tied to my specific piece of art. Similarly, you, there are also ERC20 tokens, which I think is a much more common standard in terms of creating tokens. A lot of different cryptos that you might be aware of are actually using ERC20. And the nice part about, in general, ERC20 or any, any standard for that matter is that it allows these wallets to very easily find and transact. So if everyone integrates this function, then any wallet knows that, okay, I can call this function and as long as it's ERC-20 or ERC-721, it's going to have this function in, in this exact specific um, template. So uh, it provides a bit of consistency as far as interacting with different projects on the blockchain, which I think is very valuable. The last thing I do want to go over is, okay, you understand smart contracts, you have your own wallet. Now, how do I go about actually either interacting with an existing smart contract or deploying my own smart contract? For starters, you're going to need Ethereum. And in general, in terms of development, what I would recommend is go to any of these test networks that are out there. So specifically, I think an easy one to get started with is Robston. And the way it works is it's basically this test environment where you can generate Ethereum and you can use that to deploy your own smart contracts and then just test out and make sure you don't have any bugs, make sure you can integrate with it and all of that works smoothly. So specifically here, I'll make sure to leave a link to this down in the description below, but if you're on the Robston Ethereum net, there's faucets that exist. You basically put in your address and then it will print you out one Ethereum. Great. So that's, that's exactly how you can start that process of testing. And I think that's super important. There are additionally, if like say Robston becomes really full with a bunch of developers doing crazy things, then what you can do is kind of spin up your own test net. Uh, I personally haven't done this yet, just haven't had a reason to, but if you want to, you can totally do that. Uh, I think there, at least when I was researching things, there seems to be Dockerized solutions for that. And I, I would imagine that's probably the easiest way about going and setting things up is just spin up a container that's running an Ethereum node and you're good to go. And then once you have Ethereum, you might be asking, okay, so now from, from Unity, how do I actually <laughs> interact with the blockchain? How do I interact with Robston? So for that, what I would recommend taking a look at is a protocol like Infura. So in general, what you would typically need to do is you would need to find the URL of some Ethereum node that you know is always going to be available. And then you can ping that Ethereum node with say a JSON RPC protocol. And there's a bunch of defined protocols that already exist out there. And then that is how you would send your transactions and send your messages to it and also receive that. If you don't want to go through that setup process, you can use something like Infura, which is actually the backbone for, for MetaMask as well. So something to keep in mind there. Um, this is just a service that's available that allows you to actually go ahead and set that up yourself. It has connections to a bunch of different test networks like Robston, so that makes things super easy. In terms of pricing, I mean, unless you're planning to get 100,000 requests in per day, you can, you can just use the free tier, which I think works pretty well. If you're really serious in building up this fully fledged production application, you can take a look at these. But honestly, if we're, if we're being practical at that point, you might even want to consider hosting your own Ethereum node at that point, but up to you on in terms of how you would want to go about kind of building out your own solutions. But this is what we'll, we'll need to take a look at when we take a look at the Ethereum uh, Unity SDK as you need some form of URL to start talking to the blockchain. So yeah, hopefully this video was helpful and like I said, the next video is going to be on how you can use Unity to work with Ethereum. 
which I, th I think will be from, from a developer standpoint, a lot more concrete in terms of actually getting something up and running. Again, if you have questions, let me know down the, in the comments below. If you have suggestions on future topics to dive into here in terms of Ethereum, I would love to go into it just because I think all of this stuff is super awesome. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one. It's been Fuse Man and I'm signing out.